to the Lost Ones Me Sonic Podcast. I am your host, brother Joshua Feliciano. I hail from St. James Lodge number 114, based on the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the State of New York. I am here with my co-host, Brandon Williams, who hails from George Washington Carver Lodge number 95. That I do. Based out of the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of New York. Quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed on this podcast do not re- necessarily reflect any views and opinions of any Masonic body in which myself, Brandon Williams is a member of. Welcome to episode number five, The Art of Court Cases, Clandestine Wordplay. All right, so today we're going to do something a little bit different. Today we're going to go over court cases, court cases that really um, have changed the trajectory of masonry. And what a lot of people don't know is that these Prince Hall, our Prince Hall Grand Lodges have gone to war with these bogus clandestine organizations in court in the past. Um, there's a few of them that we're going to touch on today. And, you know, the, and there's a lot of misconceptions that I want to clear up when it comes to some of these court cases. Um, we go over the whole A.C. Scott versus William, William Grimshaw court case of 1910. We're going to touch on the international court case against, against um, the most worshipful Prince of Grand Lodge of Kansas. We're going to touch on the modern free court case against the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of um, Georgia. And real quick, mentioning Georgia, I want to give a big shout out to, to the Grand Lodge of Georgia and the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Georgia for coming up with a treaty and uh, on mutual on recognition. You know, it's been 150 100%. years, you know, 150 100%. years in the making. And, and I think it's been about a month and we haven't even been able to congratulate um, Tennessee as well. Uh, Grand Lodge of Tennessee and most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Tennessee actually did the same exact thing a few weeks ago. And it's yeah, a, about a month and a half ago. We're down, we're down to five. Yo, you five states need to get it together. Like, mm-hmm. we, out, with, out with the old, in with the new. We need to stop playing games. Like, seriously. Um, so, on that note, Brandon, ready? I'm always ready. <laughs> All right, cool. So, Brent, real quick, what is one thing you notice about these about these um these court cases that that we were briefly just talking about right now when it comes to you know things that you noticed? Well, I think the first thing that um I noticed um even just skimming over them was how old they are. You know, I think a lot of times when we think about like clandestine masonry, or bogus masonry, just the history of lineage, when we start talking about it, you never really realize how far back it goes, at least from a legal perspective. So to see cases dated back as far as 1910, um, you know, again, it's just not something that we talk about typically. So even in history, it's just not something that comes up in conversations. So that was very intriguing to me to see how far back um, these legal disputes have been going with the spurious uh, Masonic entities. Um, And just the array of them. I mean, obviously, you know, it's X amount of Grand Lodges and they've all had their uh, endeavors with the uh, spurious organizations, but I never realized that it was at such a multitude for so long, dating so far back. So one thing that I also want to bring up that you also are talking about, you know, a question comes up from a lot of brothers on why is it that we don't do this anymore? Because you said, you know, we've been doing this for so long, right? Why is it that we stopped? And a lot of people don't realize that what starts to happen, and this is what started to happen a lot also with them, was that once we won the court case, they started to change their name and reincorporate under new organizations and continue the same patterns. And it became counterproductive because of the fact that we were spending more money than getting the job done. And, it, and a perfect example was Modern Web and Modern Free. Modern Free changed their name. They were taken to court and, and they lost in contempt. And you know, they were found in contempt and they law and then, you know, they, they had to pay fees for that. And it, it, you started realizing that it started costing more money to actually keep doing this. Um, 
but the, the the best part about this is that when we start looking at the verbiage of what's being used in this, and this is why I I, I call this clandestine wordplay because you have a lot of um bogus masons that will sit there and take the wordplay on this and change it up to something that it's not. Um, a popular court case in that example is the was it the the most worshipful Grand Lodge of of DC AFNAM versus William Grimshaw of who was the Grand Master of um the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of DC and this happened in 1910 and the court case is very very intriguing because right after the court case you started to see that John G Jones and AC Scott came up with this document that was called Sweeping Victory and. For some reason, a lot of these John G. Jones affiliated Grand Lodges think this is a legal court document. Um, I'm going to show you guys what this document looks like so you guys can have an understanding of what I'm talking about. It's this document here. It clearly states sweeping victory for the legal AFNEM Mason in the United States of America. Problem is that this is not a legal document. What this is is just a letter to whoever was John G. Jones affiliated Grand Lodges, and it, and it's a seven page document. When we and go just, over, and just go ahead, go I'm ahead. sorry not to cut you off, Josh, mm-hmm. but just for clarity, when he says it's not a legal document, what he means is it's that it's not legal court proceedings uh, from the case. So we don't want you to think that this wasn't a uh, a valid document for his uh, you know subordinate entities. But what he's saying is is that it's not the actual proceedings from the court case. Just for reference. Right. So everybody think that this is, you know, that. And when we start going over this document, you start realizing a lot of holes because we actually have the actual proceedings of this court case. And I have it with me today. And I want to sit here and compare the two because I want people to understand that this document is a fraud. There's a lot of holes in this. And when you compare it to what really happened, you start realizing that they're telling a story that didn't happen. I guess because back then it was so hard to get a hold of these. That it was easy for everybody to just sit there and say, problem is, is that technology has advanced so much now that we can go back and actually look at this. So real quick, first mistake I notice here is they try to sit there and they try to sit there and say for the legal AF and AM Masons in the United States of America. Now, that automatically is the reason why everybody thought that this was a legal, a legal court document. Um, first and foremost, this, this first page already has a typo in it. When we look at the beginning, the court of appeals happened in February of 1910, but yet there's a typo that says 1901. So automatically that's, that's the first red flag, right? Then we start going down and we sit here and it says, um, what is it? Sustaining the legal, the legality of lawful and legal and regular, first of all, not regular, but most worshipful Grand Lodge AFNM at Washington, D.C., in which A.C. Scott is Grand Master, St. John's Grand Lodge AFNM, where, where John G. Jones is Grand Master, and then St. Andrew's Grand Lodge, where W.T. Grant of New Orleans is the Grand Master. Now, and then they talk about calling Prince Hall bogus. That would never happen in a legal document. So when we look at the actual document, the actual court document, notice on the top, it's just most worshipful Grand Lodge H- AF and AM of DC versus Grimshaw. So that tells you that the other two entities, John G. Jones and AC Scott, I mean, I scale um, with WT Grant was not a part of the actual filing of this document of this court case. So automatically, that's the first red flag I noticed, right? Now let's go back to the actual sweeping victory. And let's look further down, right? The decision rendering in 1908, keep going down. There's, it, there's a lot of fluff in here. Mind you, the biggest difference between the two is that one is seven pages and the other one is only two. Yeah, right? the actual proceedings are pretty cut and dried. Right. <laughs> the other, the, the appeals is actually two pages. 
Um, there's a part in here. I'm trying to see if I can find it. Was it page four? Was it page four? If I'm not mistaken, the mid middle of the bottom of four. Um. Was this a decision? Decision of the Court of Appeals now brings W.H. Grimshaw, Myers, and... Right, here it is. I uh, know it's identified, uh, associated with them, respectively, John G. Lewis, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, come to grief by the decision rendered by the Court of Appeals against the regular... And irregular, All right, here we go. Uh, yeah, we go up a little bit more. So one of the biggest things that says here is as... Um, received from the White Grand Lodge, AFNA and Masons of the Republic of Romania stood the test before the court of appeals and was sustained before the court of appeals and legal Masonic doctrine that they are the right and legal body of Freemasons. Um, that's mm-hmm. not what happened. First and foremost, it talks about receiving a charter from Re- Republic of Romania. We know very well, and it's been proven over and over again that there was never a charter from Romania. In the actual court case, John G. Jones took the stand and actually said that Dorsey Seville came up with that lie. That it was they never had a they never had a um a charter from Romania. There's never been any proof of that. So automatically now you're sitting here catching another lie. Then it says here and it says the doctrine that they are the right and our legal body of Freemasons. The court case was never about that. When we look back at the court right. case. <laughs> The court case wasn't about legal Freemasons. It was about the name. It says it right here. Oh, the only difference in their names consists of the word ancient. Ancient. This was Which only is found a, in the title of the incorporated body. Right. So this was only about that. This wasn't about legitimacy within the, them as Masons. And that's another false um, representation here. Um, another thing that which I can't find on here talks about um, that the courts have ruled that they were going to uh, pay for legal fees. That's in, the le- that's in the legal document. That's in the proceedings. Second page should be the second to last paragraph on the right side. Right. But on, on, on this on the sweep of victory, this is another conflict of interest because it sit there and it says that they're paying half of their legal <laughs> fees. But when you look at the actual court document, like you said, is on the second page, each party will pay the cost incurring by it in this court in this court respectively. It is so ordered. So that means that they're paying for their own court fees. Correct. Prince Hall didn't pay for half of their court fees. So there's a lot of issues with this. And there's a lot of misconceptions in this court case that really, really is 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 flawed. And when it comes to, to, to what's going on here, you can tell that this document was only created to, to blind those members into thinking that they actually were legal masons and they had to blind them to think that, oh, that Prince Hall was bogus and to try to keep them. Yeah, not only that, I think that it was, a, it was an attempt to uh, slander legitimate Prince Hall bodies and um, you know, it's just uh, to create like spurious bragging rights. It's like, yo, I beat you. Mm-hmm. You're like, like, I you took an L. And I'm just gonna, you know, rub it in your face. It was, it was really, really a problem, and um, that's one of the biggest court cases that I really wanted to get over and try to go around because the thing was that this is a very, very mis- big misconception within these John G. Jones Grand Lodge uh, affiliated Grand Lodges that they think that this is a legal document when it's not. Um, and I needed to bring to attention the actual legal document that is a part of, of this situation. And because they don't even know that this document even exists, that the actual legal court proceedings actually exist. Um, did, did Grimshaw lose his court case? Yeah, he did. He did, because at the end of the day, um, that word ancient being attached to that Grand Lodge um, name and it being incorporated, that's what it was about. Um, it was about yeah, if, being a legal business. Yeah, if anything, he won the battle and not the war. But if, it, if anything, because I mean, he he won the case in that regard, as far as the the legality of the name and business is concerned. Right. 
and that's the point that I want to bring across also is that this is a perfect example of you can run a legal business. Nobody's telling you you can't. I'm never going to sit in there and say you're a bogus legal, you're a bogus business. It's, it's the American way. But we all know Why that. <laughs> no, but it, we all know that we judge Masonically, a legal Masonic body differently. Everybody. Yeah, that's all in house. That's all in house. Right. I ain't got nothing exactly. to do with court. <laughs> and we can and we can actually see other court cases where this is brought to the attention of 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 every of everybody. Um, perfect example. When you look at the court cases with international and and, and modern freight, mm-hmm. international had their court case against the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of of what was it? Uh, Kansas in 1958. Kansas, yeah. Right in 1958. 58, 57, 58. Right. This court case was a very, very intriguing because um, it went through a lot of the, the, the stuff that was going on um, within the organization and, and, and international lost this. Um, this court case, there was a lot of lies that were found. Um, William Banks tried to sit there and say that he was a part of a Prince Hall Lodge in Kentucky, and he said that it has shut down. And it came back that this lodge is actually still in effect to today. And <laughs> he was never a member. Um, there's a lot of uh, of stuff being said that, that was said that his name was stricken from the rolls and it was removed and all this other stuff. No, it was not. Um, according to the court case, it says that Banks recited in his affidavit that he was initiated into St. John's Masonic Lodge in 1925. Um, and his father was also initiated in there in 1901. Um, he, he stated that the reason why he was never not a part of that lodge anymore is because the lodge ceased to, um, to operate. Um, unfortunately, that lodge is to this day is still operating. And that was a lie, according, you know, according record, to the, that's not unfortunate either. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. So and, and then and then Banks goes on and admits that he was a member of Modern Free. Um, and, and this is the, the best part is that the courts found that International was purposely trying to deceive the public. And they said that Banks started. Uh, bank stated by using the word "modern" in connection with um, with free and accepted masons, it had made a special effort to make certain that prospective members understood that it and the Prince Hall group of lodges that were same that were not in the same organization. Nevertheless, it is affirmative stated in affidavits of merit that International had used and employed rituals, insignias, and et cetera, which are the same as those used by appealants. Uh, uh, it is also, it is further shown that affiance uh, had been in fact misled into joining the applicant's lodge, lodges. So the courts had determined that international was misleading the public by saying that no, we're not the same, but we follow the same rituals, we follow the same um, structure. We well, now they don't, but you know they they have the same um, aprons and things like that. So what happens after this court case is international then changes its ways by adding the fez, so they don't look the same no more. Um, they added a key underneath the square and compass, so so you can def- show that they're not the same organization. And and their structure is also different. When you look at their structure, they have a crossover method where you go up to York, right? Cross over to Scottish, right? And finish the whole rest of the 33, never touching the beginning of the Scottish, right? The Lodge of Perfection. Crazy. Insanity. Um, Let me say it one more time. Ridiculous. It's it's just crazy. Never like calling themselves a Scottish, right? Organization, but never touching the Lodge of Perfection. Doesn't make sense to me. Um, I ain't they, gonna and, say it no more. <laughs> and they do that now. That's what they do now. Um, then the mo- another interesting one is the modern free case of 1951, where they went up against the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Georgia. Um, this was interesting because the courts actually flat out called them a fraudulent organization, and this is something that where you barely ever see. Um, and this is why we use the word, the term bogus, because the, the, the term bogus 
means that you're intimidating. You're 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 sitting here and not intimidating, but um, you're copying, imitating. you're imitating, you're copying, <laughs> and 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 a lot of people don't understand that bogus means you're a fraud, and this is a perfect example of that actually happening because the courts actually recognized it. Um, so in this court case, Jerry Baldwin, who's the founder of of Modern Frame, admitted under oath that his organization was was clandestine. The court documents clearly read that the petitioner made no attempt to prove that it had received any warrant or authority from any duly constituted Masonic group. In fact, the grandmaster of petitioner admitted lack of such authority. This is directly from the court case. Then um, it also showed that Modern Free didn't have a Masonic charter. They only had a state charter which we all know state charter, the state doesn't give you the right to operate a Masonic organization. Um, Correct. The courts also acknowledged that Modern Free was not a legitimate organization. And this is the crazy part. This is the part that I was talking about. Is And I'm going to read it. It says, I find that the defendants use the word, use of the words of free and accepted is an infringement on the real name and trade of the plaintiff. And as such, and is such a colorable, imitation therefore that the general public in the exercise of ordinary care might think or be led to believe that the name and of the plaintiff who had the first and prior right use of the name i find as a matter of fact that the use of the words free and accepted by the defendant which is modern free is a fraud against the plaintiff which is print all who is entitled to the use of the words and that the dominant controlling mastermind of the defendant, J.B. Baldwin, intended to create the impression in the minds of the public and he and his group were the ancient and original free and accepted Masons, which they are not. (laughs) I mean, if this is not a blow... And like, and I'm talking like literally, this is coming directly from the courts who. No, it, I wouldn't even call it a blow. Like it, it is what it is. Right. And I, and I think not to, you know, leap ahead, but I think, you know, um, you know, people ask us like, you know, why are we doing this? Why are we bringing it up? Or why is it such a big deal? And it's like, it's in plain writing. Like th- these aren't my words. These aren't Josh's words. Like this is a, a, a court of law that is mm-hmm. determining that, um, Quite frankly, Modern Free in this case has literally infringed on Prince Hall's trademark um, and incorporation uh, using the name Free and Accepted in their moniker. So, um, you know, this isn't something that we just came up with. Um, I'm certainly not that creative. I mean, Josh is a little bit more artistic than I am. That's for sure. But I mean, you know, like we don't have that much time on our hands, quite frankly, to conjure all of this. Shit we're showing you like this is this is. And, public record <laughs> and this is, and that's the thing and this is the reason why i brought up the modern free one because modern free in the past has gone on record to tell their members that we made all this up that prince hall affiliated <laughs> made all this up and that we took the time to do all this and that they are legitimate and so on and so forth that this is a lie and and, and i'm sitting here like do you not realize how much energy it takes to sit there and create such a document and yeah, it's like, I can give you an idea. <laughs> so this is not a lie. This comes to any, and, 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 and let me just make this very clear. Anybody can sit here and request these documents from the courts. These are not private documents. These they're are not sealed at all. Like no, they're not concealed. Anybody can access these. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a crazy, crazy. Cause if you guys go to the Philaxis society, uh, bogus masonry page there's a list of of court cases there that everybody can see and and read and and look at um it's Mm -hmm. not all of them i guarantee you it's not all of them there's a lot more maybe six or seven yeah it's it's it's, it's it's not not all of them right it's there's there is a lot more um to my understanding the only court case that prince all lost against these organizations was the one against uh john g jones ac scott and that's because Mm -hmm. it just wasn't done correctly that's it. At the end of the day, it's hard to sit there and, and sue and literally win a court case when it comes to a name. 
And the perfect example of this was the most recent court case where PHO took a, 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 another bogus body and took them to court over the use of the word York. And yeah, that was an um, national grand. It was, it was PHO. Complex. Yeah. Yeah. The national yeah, grand. Um, right. Yeah. So they took them to court and lost <laughs> because of the use, because of the word of the use York. Um, it's, 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 it's not an easy thing to win a court case like that. But when we talk no, about it's, it's, technicalities, it's easier to prove if a, if, if a Grand Lodge is being, is being fraudulent because when you take them to court, everything becomes public. All their records become public. Right? A lot of people like to sit there and say defamation. Um, was it um, defamation? Defamation of character. Right. And they want to throw and they want to throw that around that they can take them to court, not realizing that the defense is the truth is a defense when it comes to that. And so to prove that, you have to literally take these dudes to court and you have the right to request every single document, which means all their minutes. It Correct. means all their bank records, all their proceedings, how they're handling their money or their treasury reports or their secretary mm-hmm. reports, all that becomes public. So you have to sit there and you have to prove that um, everything is, is the, that they're not being fraudulent to their members. All that becomes public record. So, you know, a lot of people don't understand how, what it takes to take somebody to court. Um, especially, especially at the business level, when you're dealing with corporate entities, it's, it's a lot more right. tricky than, you know, person to person. Right. And then you have other, other situations with, um, for example, one of the biggest and funniest situations was when Hiram of Tyree Grand Lodge took Sons of Light Grand Lodge to court in California. And this was a really, really crazy court case because the courts actually acknowledged both of them as clandestine. And, and this is where a lot of people don't really recognize that you can go back to other court cases and use that as evidence. Correct. And so if, if and, 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 and the courts will sit there and say, well, according to this court case, X, Y, and Z, and use that, and, and it's, it's a wrap. Um, so, yeah. Brandon, any thoughts on what we're talking about right now? Um, again, just to uh, reiterate, um, you know, firstly, um, again, it was, it was not a shock, but it was eye-opening for me to, to see how far back these cases went, um, just the history of it. Because, again, it's not something that, you know, when you talk about bogus masonry, you always talk about the now, like the fight now. And we don't really realize that this thing goes back well over 100 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, The second thing is, is that, you know, there's been a lot of uh, clandestine organizations um, well over the last 100 years. Um, And, you know, you got to forgive me. I'm a philosophy major. Right. So I'm, I'm the guy that asks the question why. And, you know, I like to go down the rabbit hole. And, you know, some of them are just personal, personal beefs, grudges, gripes, things that don't really get situated or settled. And then, you know, I'll give people the benefit of the doubt and say some people just th- didn't know any better, mm-hmm. which more often than not, that you know, that happens a lot of the time. People just don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't know how these things work. So they right. just kind of fall into, you know, spurious organizations or even just, oh, hey, like, I want to be amazing. Let's go buy some books and and read and. Just, you know, do our own thing, not really realizing that like, it's a process and it, it precedes and, all of us. And you know what the crazy, <laughs> and, and you know what the crazy thing is? A lot of these organ when you look at these, um, these court cases, when they start out, you read them, they go over the history of both organizations. Correct. So you see who started <laughs> what organization. Correct. <laughs> you can see, you know, and, and, and let's go back to that John, the, the John G. Jones and the AC Scott John one, G, right? baby. John G. Like, the legend. <laughs> it, it, it was written how how he how that Grand Lodge, the AC Scott Grand Lodge, had William Gray as a member. How William Gray was was literally the Grand Lodge Grandmaster of St. John's, right? 
And it's and it's crazy how we don't even know who the hell Grant William Gray is. We don't know who made him a Mason. <laughs> we have no record of who made him a Mason. They, they're real quick to sit there and say, yeah, William Gray was a legitimate Mason, right? He saved John G. Jones. And I'm like sitting here like, but we don't even, what? Like, how do you? I'm like, what, <laughs> I'm like, what organization made him a Mason? Who made him a, a Mason? Which when, lodge? I'll wait. When was he made a Mason? <laughs> who was I'm, there? Like, I wasn't. <laughs> how, how was his organization started? And it's like, you're calling him a legitimate Mason, but yet you don't even have your facts straight. Correct. So unfortunately, you know, we have a lot of that going on. Um, you know, this is going to be a short episode because when you talk about court cases, court cases can get very boring. And I don't want to keep going through every single one because, you know, I really wanted to touch on the John G. Jones and AC Scott one because that's probably the biggest misconception one that a lot of people are not aware that guess what? We have legal documents for that. Yeah. They, a they're lot literally, of people assume that it was just about and like I, sonic legitimacy and it wasn't. And I want people to actually implore and uh, compare the two documents, compare the two documents. Yeah, so you can sit there and see <laughs> like literally it's, it's on the Philaxis society website, like on the bogus Mason website. Like, and it's free. <laughs> compare <laughs> the two year. documents. Seriously. I think the, uh, the, some of these John G. Jones affiliated Grand Lodges have it on their website to try to look at the, make them try to make themselves look like they're legitimate. Compare the two documents. Actual corrupt proceedings with two pages, if that, like not even really a full two eight by twelve pages. But it was this is like what, one and, and, and a half a po- compared to seven. So, <laughs> so, so, so you have to ask yourself how much fluff is in the other document. To try, to try to sit there and say that, you know, this is real. I write a lot of papers. It's, it's a lot of fluff in there. <laughs> so, yeah, I think we're going to close out. We're going to keep it simple. If there's any questions, if I need to do a part two, I have no problem doing a part two. Oh, um, sure. You know, just any, any closing thoughts, Bren? Yeah. Yeah. Closing thoughts, man. Look, um, come on down. Hey, look, um, you know, we here. I look, I look, my whole thing is is, you know, all jokes aside, you know, a lot of guys, you know, a lot of stories I hear, you know, from guys like Josh and other brothers that came over, you know, they you don't want you don't want to be that guy that's on the road and you got emblems on your car and you get ran down on and it's like, yo, what's up, bro? Where you where you from? And it's like, huh? Like you that's just a bad situation to be in. I will um, always you spend less so money into I will always <laughs> ahead, sit there and help somebody if they're on the road. But we 100%. got triple. We got triple A for a reason. One hundred percent. I just mean like from the perspective, like um, you don't, you know, it, it's never happened to me, obviously. But like, I find it very disheartening. Even like when I meet people and they tell me they're from certain lodges, and I'm like, I don't know that name, but I'm pretty sure it ain't one of mine, and it ain't one of Twenty Third Streets. Um, it, it, it's just unfortunate because you know this guy's been around 20, 30 years. I think. People Not the slightest need, idea that, and I think people need to also understand credit, that it's credentials it, ain't right. One of the biggest <laughs> things I've heard before was it's all the same. It is nah, not. It, it's not all the same. I mean, you know, I now I'll play devil's advocate, even from like a ritualistic perspective. Sure, you can buy all the books and, and do everything, but when it comes to lineage, uh, rights of membership, um, traveling, it. it Man, it's night and day. It's 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 not what you think it is. That's that's for sure. You you think you're good and you're not. And it's it's not from what I've been told. It's not a good feeling. No. So I say all that to say, hey, come on down. When you whenever you're ready, we got you. <laughs> and, that, and and, and, you know, and I'm glad you're saying that because I think they have a misconception that we won't welcome. Yeah, um, shit. Come come um, shit. <laughs> come on down. No, we like, want you. I'm gonna tell you right now. I I came I, I came from from that side. And when I came into Prince Hall, I had brothers like literally open arms and ready to talk to me, ready to to to, to bring me in. And and literally, one of the is the best decision I ever made. You know what I'm saying? And people want to stay, want to they want to stay because they love where they are, and it's cool. It's cool. Just know you're not you're, you're not, not legitimate. That, that's it. No, and it's not a numbers game for us either. You're like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm a firm believer that less is more. Um, and that goes without saying. So if you think this is just a, a ploy to <laughs> <laughs> raise our numbers like dude I'll, I'll make do with the 500 opposed to 10,000 worthless human beings like I'm I'm good on the 500 pimp 
I'm a fan of the Spartans. Less is more. So if you think it's a numbers game, you're sadly mistaken, my friend. We good. Right. We don't welcome everybody. We don't. Correct. That's just not how it works. Um, but at the end of the day, we got to understand that. You know what I'm saying? The door's always open. We don't sit here. If you if you if you're seeking, just oh, just, just knock. Just knock. Um, the door will I, be open. I'm gonna close out by saying this. The biggest reason why I left the other organizations is because I researched. There was a lot of red flags, and I could yeah. not ignore these red flags. And when it's all said and done, you're going to have people who are part of these organizations that are high up that are going to lie to your face because they don't want you to leave because it's going to hurt their pockets. Mm. End of story. They can sit there and teach you the philosophy, and that's great. They can sit there and give you the brotherhood. That's awesome. But that doesn't make you legitimate. So with this said, with that said, thank you for coming. Thank you for 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 being here again. Um, everybody, thank you for watching. Do not forget to f- subscribe, like, and share. Um, but getting a lot of good feedback regarding the um these episodes. I'm gonna continue going as much as I can. Um, you know, there's only so much we can talk about this, and we can try to spread this out how much as we can. Um, at some point, we're gonna have to evolve to different topics and different things. Um, but I really wanted to start the basis on educating against this epidemic that we have in Freemason. So until the next episode, I see you guys. Peace. Peace.